Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar hosted by the Health and Human Rights Institute of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. This is the third installment of the Health and Human Rights Institute's web series devoted to addressing mental health disparities. Today, we will be discussing mental health among young people in marginalized communities, and we have a thoughtful presentation planned for you. This virtual series is made possible through the generous sponsorship of the National Black Talk Association for Education and Talent Development. My name is Maya Watson, and I bring you greetings on behalf of the Health and Human Rights Institute. I would like to welcome each of you today, and we hope that you are doing well at this time. Before we begin, we would like to clarify that the thoughts and ideas expressed today are those of each individual. They do not reflect the views of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, nor any of its agents, employees, or components. We invite our attendees to ask questions through the Q&A link option on Zoom, and then we will pose those questions to our panelists during our question and answer period at the end of this event. This is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we will be discussing the state of mental health among young people in marginalized communities. To aid us in this discussion, we have the following panelists. Jaina Johnson Davis, who is an at-large school board member of the City School a Master's of Arts in Urban Education from Goddard College, and an Education Specialist degree in Curriculum and Instruction from Piedmont College. Jaina is a co-founder of the Beacon Hill Black Alliance for Human Rights, and she is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She and her husband are proud parents of two sons who are both students at Howard University. Please join me in welcoming Jaina to the panel. Thank you. Next, we have Casey Venning. Casey is the Programs Manager for the National Alliance on Mental Illness Georgia. She thrives from speaking, teaching, and facilitating opportunities for others to realize their purpose and to help provide tools to help them actualize their gift to, the, to others. She has done this through her work with Fortune 500 companies such as Coca-Cola, L'Oreal Paris USA, Scholastic, Home Depot, and most recently, NAMI Georgia. For the past four years, Casey's focus has been on the intersection of faith and mental health and providing mental health first aid training, specifically for those who serve and work with youth. Casey, in, in addition to her work in the nonprofit field, she is also an ordained minister, teacher, author, and speaker. She focuses on topics such as faith and mental health, purpose branding, youth and servant leadership, and community bu building through partnerships. Casey holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in sociology, a Master's of Divinity candidate at the Interdenominational Theological Center, and she is the co-founder of Helping Empower Youth, Inc., and the author of Built for This, A Young Woman's Journey to Self-Discovery and Empowerment and Wrestling with Peace. Welcome, Casey. Thank you. And finally, we have Erica Williams-Walker, who is the Behavioral Health Program Manager for Fulton County. Erica is a licensed professional counselor who has worked in the behavioral health field for 16 years, and she has worked for Fulton County government for the past 12 years. For 11 years, she served as a social service program manager overseeing operations at one of the day programs for adults with intellectual developmental disabilities, and she's currently a behavioral health program manager. Mrs. Walker's current role involves oversight of the contractual services for all of the department's behavioral health locations and oversight of the developmental disabilities division. She began her counseling career as a graduate level intern at the organization formerly known as Atlanta Union Mission and went on to become a full-time counselor and then shelter director before moving on to Fulton County government. During her tenure at the mission, Mrs. Walker developed her passion for working with women with children who suffered from mental illness, substance abuse, homelessness, and childhood trauma. 
Erica received her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville and her master's degree in counseling psychology from Argozi University. Welcome, Erica. I'd like to welcome all of our panelists and welcome each of you here today as we begin our discussion on the mental health of youth and marginalized communities. Okay, so Erica, let's start with you. A recent report found that half of all mental health conditions start by 14 years of age. While this often manifests itself into treatable symptoms, most of those cases are undetected and untreated, especially for African American and Latinx children who have a one and a half to three times greater odd, odds of having unmet mental health needs than white children. While we know that adolescent mental health is an issue in all communities, what makes youth and marginalized communities such a special concern? Yes, I think it's a special concern in marginalized communities because we all know the narrative, you know, very well of the possibilities of what can happen to an adolescent that has an underlying mental health condition. Um, because, you know, those symptoms typically manifest themselves at home, at school, and in the community. And a lot of the times, um, people are focusing on, um, instead of focusing on what could be the underlying issues, often we focus on the behavior itself. And so it kind of, you kind of equate it the same as, you know, someone treating the symptoms instead of the disease as a whole. And so with adolescents, that's already a very difficult stage where their hormones are out of control, their emotions, um, and then, so when you add on that untreated, undiagnosed, and often misdiagnosed mental health condition, and you often have a young person who now has been labeled wherever they are. So in school, they're labeled, you know, it's difficult, defiant, unruly. And then, you know, at home, you know, they're just this difficult teenager and no one is really working together to, you know, try to plan on how to help them. And so we tend to be very reactive instead of proactive. And so, of course, with parents, you're kind of scrambling around, you know, with your everyday tasks of trying to figure out how you're going to pay bills, transportation. And so, you know, then you have this teenager who you suddenly don't recognize as living under your roof. And so um, it's, it's definitely a special concern because in marginalized communities, you add on trauma to, to that as well. And so it's, it's definitely important to, to take a specialized look at this, this particular population. Thank you for that, Erica. Would anyone else on the panel like to add to that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Jaina, let's, let's move to you. The more risk factors adolescents are exposed to, the data shows that there's a greater potential impact on their mental health. Can you discuss some of the cultural and societal factors that contribute to risk factors for you? Yeah, so I would reference the ACE study or the Adverse Childhood Experience study that was done several years back by um, the CDC and Kaiser, where they identified um, around 10 adverse childhood experiences that can impact um, short-term and long-term mental and physical health for adults. And so um, among those are three, the three that come to mind for me, um, would be um, in having an incarcerated household member. We know how um, mass incarceration has disproportionately and negatively impacted um, communities of black and brown folks. And so um, that's definitely a risk factor that, um, you know, too many children face by having a household member incarcerated. Um, parental separation and divorce is another one of those adverse childhood experiences that could um, uh, be a risk factor for a young person. Um, we know that 65% of African American households um, in 2018, according to the Annie Casey Foundation, um, the 65% of um, African American households were um, single parent. And so that could contribute um, to being a risk factor um, for our youth. Um, and then uh, household mental illness. Um, we, I know that we will discuss this further, 
but because of stigmas in black and brown communities to um, getting, um, seeking support um, through mental um, health professionals, um, that can impact um, a child adversely and, and then, you know, impact them as, a, as adults. And not having access to affordable um, health care um, that would allow them to um, get the mental health that they need, mental health rather. And so those are some of the societal, um, and there, you know, again, according to that CDC Kaiser study, there were about 10 risk factors including physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, emotional abuse. And so those are some of the societal factors that can contribute to that increased exposure for our young people. Thank you, Jaina. I think it's important that we're aware of some of these risk factors so that we know how to combat them when they're when they're prevalent in our communities. Uh, Casey, according to a congressional report released in December of 2019, the suicide rate for black youth is rising faster than those of any other racial and ethnic group, now making it the second leading cause of death for black children aged 10 to 19. Mm -hmm. The report talks about how suicide attempts rose 73% from 1991 to 2017 for Black adolescents of both sexes, while attempts among white youth decreased. Um, and we want to hear from all of our panelists, but let's start with you, Casey. Can you talk specifically about what can be done to address this heart-wrenching trend? Sure. I think part of it is cultural and it's historical. And I think Jaina was alluding to it um, in terms of the stigma that we find in our communities. Um, far too many times our young people will come to us and, you know, maybe share that they're upset about something and we may dismiss it, right? And not intentionally, not maliciously, but so many of us are running households. We're stretched already financially. We're stretched trying to show up at work. And so when our kids come and say, hey, I don't feel right, but I don't know what the right is, well, we'll talk about it later. Or you're just tired. Or you need to stop stressing out. And because we don't create this open environment for them to really be able to express themselves fully without judgment or being dismissed, far too many times they begin to hold that in and then they are not equipped to handle it by themselves. Truth be told, none of us are. Um, and I think part of that is us be becoming a more welcoming community um, in our own homes um, and with the children that we have been assigned to. Um, I think also it requires us to be aware that our children are dealing with so much more than we did at our age. I know that when I speak to people and I share with them about what it means to be an active and a non-judgmental listener, it is not telling your child, oh, you're 13, you don't know anything about that, you'll get over it. Or when I was that age, I handled this this way. Well, society is different. Families look different. Your economic status may be different than when you were 13. And the fact is, they only have 13 years of knowledge, right? They don't have the luxury of understanding what life is and having hindsight because they've made it to 30, to 40, or to 50 years old. So for them, their limited perspective is all that they have. So for us not to take time to really listen to what they're saying and not saying, girl, you'll get over that boy. Or, you know what, it, it's not a rush to grow up. They, they don't have any point of reference for that. So I think part of it is changing our language so we can change our environment for our young people. And that will then begin to make them feel a little bit more safe when it's time to come and say, hey, I don't feel good, but I don't know how to describe it. And so that as a family, you can begin to unpack it and find the support that they need. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Casey. So parents and adults and, and these young people's lives, we need to be open, we need to listen to them and change our language, as you mentioned, and not just brush off um, red lights that, that, that yeah. we may encounter. I'm, Erica and Jaina, did you want to add to that? I was going to add, I think, you know, I'm a former classroom teacher. I just came out of the classroom last school year, but I, I think increased training for teachers in terms of childhood trauma um, and how to deal, uh, how to spot 
some of the um, behaviors and then how we deal with that. So we don't just write them off as a high flyer or a, a quote unquote bad uh, student. Of course, there are no bad students, but um, I think there needs to be increased um, uh, training um, for teachers. Excellent, increased training for teachers. Thank you, Jaina. Mm -hmm. Erica, did you wanna add to that? No, I think the ladies covered it um, greatly, Casey and um, Jaina, that there needs to be more open dialogue in amongst parents and relatives even. I mean, really focusing on like who the individual, the teenager feels comfortable talking to and, you know, empowering that person to maybe take more time or, you know, get more information out of them. Because once a lot of times what happens is once they come to the parent and the parent kind of shuts them down, then you've oftentimes lost that opportunity. And so with everyone being involved in their care and looking into and checking into what's going on with them is important. So if they're not getting it at home, then if that teacher has that training, mm -hmm. then that, that teacher can catch it. And then if the after school person has that training, so certainly the, the training factor and then educating everyone that touches a child along the way is, yes. is definitely necessary. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. And it sounds like communication is the key and the lines of communication should be open in all of those areas. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Erica, um, while we still have you with the microphone, uh, let me pose this question to you. According to the Journal of Child and Family Studies, Black adolescents with mental health issues are less likely than non-Black adolescents to receive treatment. And so Jaina alluded to the stigma that's, that can occur among these youth. Um, but we show, the studies have shown that self-stigma has contributed to youth um, maybe fearing embarrassment for seeking or receiving behavioral health treatment services. How can we address stigma among uh, young people in marginalized communities? Right, and I, I think it goes back to what we talked about. Communication is the biggest thing. I think if we start to talk about um, mental health and emotional health and wellness, in our everyday lives, then that then you begin to decrease that stigma um, amongst you that it's, it's normal to need to be able to talk to someone. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times, right, they don't want to talk about it, they feel shame, they, you know, they blame themselves. And then a lot of the times we see mental illness as the person who we may encounter in our communities, right, that may be homeless, or um, you see them hallucinating on the streets. And so a lot of the times people are like, oh, I'm not that person. And so they immediately discount um, what, what they're experiencing. So I believe it's really important to just open up the dialogue amongst, again, everyone that, that touches that individual. So I think we have to talk about mental health in the way that we talk the same about if you don't brush or floss your teeth, your teeth are going to fall out that right. if you don't address you know, how you feel and talk about what's going on inside of your head, these are the things that, that are gonna happen you know, on the outside. And so um, teaching children early on to practice self-care, expressing how they feel, teaching them about their self-esteem, like just early on really tackling that when, we're, when they're in preschool, Yes. Almost, because, you know, if children learn it, then they're going to take it home and then they're going to talk to their parents about it. So if everyone just begins to have this everyday conversation about how I feel, how I think, what, you know, what's ahead for me and, and what's going on, whether it's good, bad or ugly, then I, I think that is how we begin to break down the stigma. Yeah, and if I can, I just want to add um, to Erica's last point around the communication piece. I want to do training with parents and caregivers, and for those who intentionally want to open up lines of communication and be more effective communicators, sometimes they need the tools. And a lot of times we ask our children, how was your day at school? And they say, fine, and we leave it there. Well, fine is one of those words that, that means 
I'm not ready to talk about it. It could have been great. It could have been horrible, but I either don't feel comfortable. I don't feel safe. I don't have the words. I don't have the energy um, to really expound upon it. And so I really encourage parents to ask those open-ended questions, right? Well, tell me the best thing that happened to you today at school. If you could have redone this day and designed it any way that you wanted to, what would have been the perfect day for you? Um, what was it that your classmate said to you that annoys you today? Because when you begin to ask questions like that, you begin to hear what the real issues are. Because if they can redesign their day, and it's totally different from what they actually experience, there's something there that's telling you that's off balance, something that they don't quite you know, agree with or something that made them feel safe or comfortable. And then those are the things that you begin to watch out for. So we have to get more creative in our communication to really get the answers that we want. Um, when we're talking about youth and adolescents, nine times out of 10, you're not gonna get a straight answer the first time. Right. And you have to become a detective a little bit, more like a sleuth, and you have to figure out what questions to ask to get the information that you need so that you can hold it in your pocket and really begin to unpack what it is that they're saying and what they're doing. But I, no matter how happy and how bubbly your child is, how well adjusted you think they are, never accept fine or it was a good day as an answer. That is unacceptable right now yes. because of what we're dealing with. It is, okay, well, if it was a great day, I need you to give me five things that made it absolutely wonderful for you. And if they can't, then we know it wasn't so great, you know, as they were saying. And so I think we just have to be more creative um, in our communication to make sure that those lines are strong, but we're also getting the information that we need. I love that, Casey. Thank you. So even if we're asking the open-ended questions, parents and guardians still need to understand we still may face communication roadblocks, right? Yeah. We still might get a fine, right? Mm -hmm. Even if we're asking open-ended creative questions. Yeah. But I think your point is don't give up, right? Keep trying Absolutely. and keep re redesigning those questions so that we do get some substantive feedback from young people. That's really good. Right, can I add one thing? Absolutely, go ahead, Jana. I was just gonna add, to, in, along the lines of communication, we just have to normalize mental health care like we do with our physical health care. With in these conversations, we know that you know we push. You know, you need to go outside and play so that you can, you know, um, you physically your your heart can be healthy and 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 everything. But it's also important for our, our mental health, right? Yes. And then we know that. Um, if there are certain symptoms that we are physically feeling like a fever or a cough or a sneeze, we're going to address that. We're probably going to call a medical uh, professional, um, you know, at least the nurse's helpline. We're going to make, a, make an appointment and we need to treat um, symptoms of mental illness the same way we would a physical illness. We have Absolutely. to, in these conversations that we're having, we have to normalize, um, you know, mental health like we do phys our physical health. Absolutely. Great point. Yeah. Great point. Um, so we do want to reiterate that if our audience has any questions to please leave those questions in the Q&A box, the option um, on Zoom. We do have one question from Alyssa Cobbs that said, um, that asked us to please share the source for the report that was cited for the suicide rates among Black youth. Alyssa, that report came from the Congressional Black Caucus that was done in December of 2019. It was also reported in the New York Times. I believe that was in December as well. So um, hopefully that'll help you find, the, find some more details about the suicide rates. Mm -hmm. um, Jaina, let's go back to you. You talked a bit about your um, background in the classroom and we know that you're an education specialist. Let's move to talk a little bit about the school to prison pipeline. Um, we know that black and brown kids are often suspended, excluded, and disconnected from schools more often than other racial groups. And this practice often um, leads them to being fast-tracked to the cr criminal justice system. What role do school suspensions and school disconnections play on the mental health of young people and their families? Well, we know, as you said, that black and brown students are disproportionately um, on the end of exclusionary discipline practices. They receive um, in-school suspensions and out-of-school suspensions um, um, much higher than their white peers. And those students have a higher probability 
um, for a range of psychological disorders, including anxiety and depression, right? And so um, oftentimes as those students are, you know, um, excluded from the classroom, they're missing, you know, critical uh, instructional time. And so, and often these students are already struggling in the classroom for a variety of, of reasons. Um, and sometimes it's because um, they have not received an equitable education, unfortunately. And so, um, but oftentimes, you know, when they're, you know, uh, pulled out for ISS or OSS, um, they are further pushed behind academically. It increases the achievement gap. Um, these students struggle with having a feeling of self-efficacy um, because the opportunities for success are being decreased by them being pulled out of school. A lot of times students fall into um, stereotype threats, which means some of the negative perceptions that folks have about groups of people, they start to internalize and believe these perceptions of them. Mm -hmm. And so they start to act, act out these stereotypes. And so um, it just further perpetuates um, you know, this um, horrible system of our students, um, uh, you know, their opportunities for academic success um, continues and, and it pushes them into the school to prison pipeline um, and, the, and their um, increased interactions with um, law enforcement. And so uh, it is something that we are dealing with in our school system. Um, our school system about five years ago um, acknowledged the historical disparity um, that has been happening um, with uh, black students in our district. And so now we are implementing um, restorative justice practices um, to try to eliminate, reduce the opportunities of um, uh, in school suspensions and out of school suspensions and expulsions. Um, and we are, have also implemented um, PBIS, which um, positive behavioral uh, interventions and supports. Um, so that it kind of takes some of the ambiguity out of language. So if a teacher, you know, writes a student up because they were being disrespectful, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so if you don't, you know, if you don't look, in my household, if you don't look me in my eye, that's disrespectful. But in another community, they may not do that out of a sign of respect. No. And so it takes some of that ambiguity that clearly states what behaviors are expected in, in every environment of the, of the school building and on the school bus. Um, and then students know, okay, uh, if, I, if this happens, these are some, some ways that I can, you know, correct this behavior mm -hmm. and um, it allows them to kind of self-correct. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I guess <laughs> that's a long answer to your question, I'm sorry. No, it's very helpful. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jaina. Um, we know that that's a, this is an epidemic <laughs> before the current pandemic that we're living with um, that has taken on much of the news cycle, the school to prison pipeline and disconnections from school that affect many of our youth um, is a very serious issue, um, as is mass incarceration and the two go hand in hand, which you, which you noted earlier. So thank you for that explanation. Casey, uh, given the spike in mental health issues among young people from marginalized communities, how much of that do you think social media plays a part in? Yeah, you know, social media, like video games, kind of gets a bad rap. Um, and not to say that there isn't any validity in that. I know as an adult, if I scroll too much on social media, I have to consciously be aware that's somebody else's life that's probably 60% false, right? Versus what I think my life should look like. And so if it, as an adult who's almost 40 has to condition her brain to say, that's somebody else's life, all of it's probably not true. They're only giving me the highlight reel. They're only showing me the positive pieces then it's that much more challenging for young people to be able to dissociate what's real 
and what's fiction or what's hype on social media. And so for a young person who's already dealing with low self-esteem, who isn't very confident in themselves, and they're seeing someone else who's living a life that they are coveting or that they want, or it seems a little bit more stable, it begins to weigh on their psyche in a way that they are now unable to handle what really is their, their life um, versus what they want somebody else to have. So I don't think social media in and of itself is necessarily a bad thing or the primary culprit. I think the challenge is, is that we, as a culture, have not learned how to safely or effectively utilize social media as a communication, as an entertainment tool, versus it being something that gives us a glimpse into someone else's life that now I want for myself. And so if we're not really limiting the amount of time that we are allowing our young people to spend on social media, especially if you see that they're challenged in their self-esteem, challenged in their academics, challenged in their confidence, yeah. then as caregivers, we're doing them a disservice just handing over these devices and saying, hey, go at your own leisure, look all you want to, scroll and tap and like and respond, mm -hmm. not understanding that this is conditioning them and burning neurological pathways in their brain about what they think life should be like, especially if it's vastly different from what the life is that they're currently living. And so there is some onus that we have as adults in the lives of our young people to limit the amount of time, to ask them what they're looking at. What about that person's life do you think is so magical or so special or so spectacular that you want it? And the difference between using something as motivation versus using it as something that then makes you feel like your life is diminished because it doesn't match up. And so we have to understand that our young people cannot be um, hidden from social media. I mean, it's, it's the way of the world. At this point, we get our news from social media before we turn on CNN or Fox or MSNBC. So it's not going anywhere. We have to then learn or teach them how to learn how to use it effectively. But really some adults need to figure out how to relearn social media <laughs> as well um, so that we can be good role models and examples for our young people. And I think it just speaks again to, you know, Young people's brains are not developed until they're 25, which is why sometimes you, you have that person who's graduated from college. They may even have a master's degree by the time they're 23. Does not mean that their brain is fully developed. So sometimes we still have to guide and facilitate the experiences that our youth and our young people are having because they haven't gain the maturity, the intellectual maturity to understand that this is just something that's great. And let me celebrate that person if this is all true versus let me not feel bad about my own life because it doesn't look like that. But I think it starts with us. And if we can figure that out for real, then we can teach our children how to do the same thing. Great point. Great point. It sounds yeah. like that. Go ahead, Jaina. I'm sorry. I'll for Casey, that point about the, the brain still being developing up until the age of 25, I, I have a recent college graduate at home, and I needed that reminder that his <laughs> your brain is still developing. I needed to hear that so badly right now. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Glad I could help. <laughs> Excellent. Erica, do you think that feelings of increased cultural and ethnic pride, could that be a source of therapy and healing for marginalized young people? Uh, yeah, I think anything helps, really. Um, so I think that children being able to learn more about their history and ancestors and traditions and rituals kind of gives them a vantage point. Um, and it definitely gives them a sense of pride because if you know there was someone before you who did these, you know, these different things that you didn't know anything about. I think that that's going to give you a sense of pride. And I also was really important with, with therapists or anyone that's working with a child is for them to be culturally aware and culturally sensitive. So they can use these different avenues and introduce it to their clients. But the thing is, 
every client needs something different. So where this one, you know, a, a child may thrive on knowing more information about their culture, their beginnings or their ancestors, another one that may not necessarily motivate mm -hmm. them. And so I think being culturally sensitive and also knowing how to tap into those resources. So if I'm a therapist and I don't know a whole lot about ancestors and traditions and those things, yeah. being able to access that information or refer them to somewhere. Maybe there's a free dance class in their neighborhood that teaches African dance. Maybe there's something over at the Arts and Culture um, Center that is free, you know, a class or something. So I think being able to tap into resources and understanding that when you're treating a child that you don't necessarily have all the answers, I think that's all really important. Yes. And and that's very important what you brought up. And I think some people may expect schools or classrooms to provide that education for young people. But as Jana mentioned, many of class, many of the classroom experiences might be inadequate in that, um, in many respects, especially in providing a cultural background for many children. Um, so parents and the communities can, can pitch in there as well. So thank you. Jaina, um, you spoke a little earlier about the societal risk factors that can impact young people. What are the protective factors um, in society and in communities that are available to counteract some of the risk factors that we discussed? So involvement in religious activity, social support, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I think um, affective relationships, affective with an A, and I, I clarify that so nobody misinterprets my South Side Chicago via <laughs> North of Rock, Arkansas accent. Um, but those relationships that are going to provide um, emotional and nurturing support are critical. Um, I mentioned that I was um, a teacher in the city schools of Decatur for the past eight years. And for six of those, my very first year going to the middle school, they asked me if I would be a club sponsor of a, a girls club. And I was a little nervous about that. I'm a, I got two boys. I'm a basketball mom. Um, but it was a wonderful experience, and I saw how important um, mentoring, the role of mentoring is um, in this context, um, in the development of, of girls, and this club was open to all girls in the middle school. It typically only attracted um, Black girls, and we have a large um, immigrant um, community um, from different countries in Africa. And so those are the girls that it attracted, but I saw how important it was for them to have a safe space um, in this um, dominantly um, white community and school. Um, and so they had a place to come and let their hair down and be themselves. Um, they had a place to talk about their frustrations, um, their perceptions of racist behavior toward them. Um, and they had an advocate in me. And so I think all children need at least, and it's not just, a, I think, research shows that if, if young people know that they have one person to play that role for them, the difference it will make in their um, academic and social development. And so I think that um, as a protective factor, um, mentoring is huge. And you mentioned organizations um, like the Girls and Boys Club and you know church groups. Um, I have, I, I, it's part of this program that I had, um, I made a kind of pseudo um, rite of passage program out of it. And, and when the eighth graders got ready to leave and go to the high school, we had a ceremony um, to mark this transition. And, um, and I, I think that's important. Um, in Atlanta, there's an organization that my husband founded with some other gentlemen in the community called Black Man Lab, where they have a weekly intergenerational conversation about different topics. And they start off the meeting by saying, does, does any brother here need a hug? <laughs> and so, and, and they get men every week before you know, the pandemic shut everything down. Now they meet online virtually. Um, but every week there's a brother who comes up who needs a hug. How many places can a brother, a black man go and, and get a hug and feel comfortable getting a hug from possible strangers? And right. so, and, and when I say black men, you know, the ages vary. They've had, um, you know, someone, children as young as five and uh, up to 85 uh, at Black Man Lab. 
Um, I also think more early um, childhood support in terms of um, we need to make sure that um, exposure, early exposure to childhood education, mm -hmm. that there are uh, programs for family members, for adults um, to get job training um, within the community to, you know, alleviate some of those other risk factors. Um, and so those are some of the things I think that can be protective factors. Excellent. Yeah, I want to add to, um, you know, those are absolutely necessary. And I think some protective factors that we don't initially think of is really um, starting at a young age and helping our you know, black and brown babies understand that their skin is not a weapon and that their skin color should not be criminalized, um, that their language is okay, right? I um, come from a Gullah Geechee background. And so growing up in the household, my friends would come over and not understand anything that my father and I were saying <laughs> because they couldn't understand the dialect. And then going to school, having to code switch um, and feeling like something was wrong with me because my first initial response would not be the King's English, right? Would not be good grammar. And being told that there was something wrong with me when there absolutely isn't anything. And so I think in building our children's confidence, one of the best protective factors is reassuring them that just as they are is enough and that there isn't anything we have to strip away we just need to maybe refine refresh you know build up um repackage sometimes depending on the situation but there isn't anything we have to pull from them there isn't anything that's wrong with them that has to be you know whitewashed for lack of a better term um in order for them to show up as their full selves and so the best protective factor is for them to know that they are already enough and then all these other things that we add to it makes it so much more effective and easier for them to accept it because they don't have to walk around feeling like there's something inherently wrong with me i live on lowry in atlanta for those of you who are familiar with downtown atlanta the west side i live on lowry right where mlk and lowry head on the other side lowry and boone i got english avenue aka the bluff and vine city and ashtrew heights and then there's the auc right i'm proud product of morris brown college the auc right there and i see so many young black boys walking the street who are already in defensive mode just because they stepped out of their door that anything I say to them is really hard for them to receive because they have now been conditioned that I'm black I'm male and I'm young there's already three things wrong with me so now let me be on guard mm -hmm. and that then is the the identity and the brand awareness that they walk around in because they have not been told and empowered that you alone are enough and let us just make sure that you have the tools that you need so that when you show up in the world you show up confident in who you are but also ready for the world to receive you wonderful Excellent advice. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, Casey, along those same lines, how do we help young adults and adolescents and teens, how do we help them recognize the signs? Yeah. So let's say that they can get over the self-stigma that, that they may encounter and they are seeking help or they're willing to seek help, but they just don't know some of the signs um, that may exist in order for them to reach out and get help. Yeah. Um, how can we help identify si the signs and places for them to go? Mm -hmm. I think this is layered a little bit. Um, and I think back to um, Erica's point earlier that she made is that part of knowing what the signs are starts with you knowing who you are so that you know when there's something a little bit different about you because signs are going to show up in people differently. So I can let you know that if your teenager is depressed, they're probably moody, they're probably tired. They're probably either overeating or not eating enough. 
Um, they've lost interest in school, their friends, activities. Um, they become silent, withdrawn, pulled in. You know, if they're anxious, they probably have some quirks and some ticks about them. Everything is an issue, it's a problem, it's 1,000, it's 100, you can't ever get them to calm down. They're super, super hyper, right? But that doesn't mean that those things show up in every child the same way. And so it starts with you knowing your child, knowing yourself as an adolescent, to say, hey, I'm sleeping because I'm legitimately physically tired, or I'm sleeping a lot because I'm emotionally tired. Mm -hmm. And for them to be able to distinguish the two takes a little bit of work. But this also means watching like a hawk, right? And it's that fine balance of not hovering and smothering them, but also understanding when something has changed, um, even slightly, that you need to be a little bit more aware of. So if eating habits have changed, if sleeping habits have changed, if they are interested in something and then all of a sudden they're not, then it doesn't necessarily mean anything because they are young people, right? So things change, but if it's not replaced with something, else that's probably a red flag um i tell people to watch out for their overachievers right i was that child i was an overachiever anything anybody asked me to do i did it still got this problem and i rock it out to the point where clearly there can't be anything wrong with her because she's getting good grades and she's speaking in church and she's speaking in community and she's in this group and she's in that group and she's down at the city and the problem was I was trying to overcompensate because I didn't want anybody to ask me what was wrong. So please don't ignore your children who were straight A students. Don't ignore your children who always show up and can perform. Don't ignore the children who always seem like they are well adjusted because it might be a coping mechanism that they want to just mask what's really happening and they don't want you to dig a little bit deeper. With that, I tell parents and caregivers and teachers, you want your children to be high performers and not necessarily overachievers. So getting them involved in 15 things because you think it's going to make their college application stand out is probably setting them up for a nervous breakdown by the time they get 25. Wow. So find two or three things that they can excel in, that they feel good about, that helps raise their self-confidence and their self-esteem, and let those two or three things be what helps define them and not feel like you've got to push them to do all these different things and then they end up getting burnt out. So we talk a lot about eating, we talk a lot about sleeping, we talk a lot about moodiness, but I think some of the signs that we miss are when our children are overperforming, when they're high achievers, because a lot of times they have just learned how to turn the switch on because if I can keep mom and daddy happy, if I can keep these A's coming in, if I can keep folks loving me and celebrating me, no one knows that I cry myself to sleep every day. No one knows that I feel anxious when I'm in a crowd full of people. No one knows that I really hate the way that I look when I look into the mirror because they put this mask on. So we know when our children aren't on, but it's when they're on is when we probably need to pay just a little bit more attention because a lot of times those kids have just really learned how to mask the symptoms. Thank you so much for that, Casey. I think that was a very thoughtful answer to that question. Um, so we definitely want to be mindful of those sig signals and, and um, red, red lights that come on from our children. And like you said, we need to be extra vigilant in our, in our observation of them. Erica, so these issues that we're talking about today, they've been talked about for decades with respect to our young people. And yet despite significant progress in research and practice and policy over the past few decades, Many children and youth continue to experience poor mental health outcomes based on socioeconomic disadvantage, memberships in ethnic or racial groups, or immigrant status. And many of these children may not meet developmental tasks, demands, or transitions in schools um, and interpersonal relationships. How can we move from research and theory to actively and equitably treating youth from all backgrounds who need mental health services? Right. And so it's important to acknowledge, I mean, we all know that a lot of these mental, poor mental health outcomes are systemic. That goes without saying, and it goes without saying that everyone needs to be created equally and that funding needs to be put in place based on those, those poor mental health outcomes. I think one of the important things about us being able to move the needle 
calls for collaboration, innovation, and creativity. And so some of that is going to involve like recruiting efforts um, early on about therapists because a lot of the times you don't see therapists in the community that look like you and so i think earlier on with with schools even really talking to children about being in the social services field and you know just increasing therapists um also for organizations that do provide mental health counseling and help for them to have some non-traditional hours. Obviously, if you're 8.30 to 5 and those are the times that parents are at work, then they can't tap into those services. And then being non-traditional in the places that you're meeting. And so oftentimes there's an office for you to walk into and paperwork. So really thinking outside the box of where can I meet these individuals where they are. Is it on a football field? Is it on a basketball court? Is it, you know, at the, the Boys and Girls Club? Um, then also for the programs that are in, in the community. And so being able to provide them with assistance, childcare, you know, do people need childcare in order to be able to access services? Do they need transportation? So really figuring out what the need is within those communities, I, I think are, are, are really key to, to us being able to move the needle as well. Because, and then you have to have a therapist that you can relate to, right? Because once, you know, we in the black and brown community, you know, are very distrustful. You know, we, we don't trust people because of the history of, um, you know, mental health and, and how people have been treated. And so someone that looks like you within your community is easier for you to be able to establish rapport um, with that person. And just like we've all talked about before, communication is key. So changing the narrative, making, um, talking about um, emotional and mental health every day conversation and defining that for parents. Oftentimes when we're at different seminars and we're set up as behavioral health and developmental disabilities, people are like, what's that? And so just at the, the grassroots of understanding what does that mean and what does that, that look like? And so again, just having mental health wherever you are, the doctor's office, the WIC office, like everybody should be talking about it. Um, yes. When you're at the barbecue, we should be talking about, you know, how are people really feeling? And um, the, the point that KC brought up was just really important, um, self-care, right? Yes. Because, because if you have this child that's overachieving and infitting activities, they're not taking care of themselves. And children don't do it well, and the adults don't do it well either. And so teaching self-care early on, what does that look like? We so often when you talk, you know, you say you're fine. Again, what does that mean? What are you doing to take care of yourself? When was the last time you just stopped and didn't do anything? And so again, moving the needle, educating everyone. So pastors, coaches, teachers, like everybody has to be able to have a conversation about mental health and tell the truth, you know, about how they're feeling and what they're experiencing and, and what the need is. And so I think it has to be a global um, response and just collaborative around the people who are already doing the, the work in the community. Thank you so much, Erica. Appreciate that. Let us now move to our question and answer period. We, we have a few questions from the audience that we will address now. So one of our attendees asked if any of our panelists could suggest any training programs for teachers regarding teaching and supporting students in trauma or any books, speakers, or other resources that they've come across. Jaina, would you like to tackle that question? I I could send them so that you could share them. Um, yes. Or any other resources that I, but I. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just don't have a um, a list available right now. Um, but I could share that, and maybe you you could have it posted somewhere. Absolutely. So we want to tell our audience that after this uh, webinar is over in about a week, the recording of this webinar will be up on our website, 2020healthsummit.org, and we will also post resources so we can put them there uh, for our audience to review later. Yeah, but also I know um, 
just for a plug for NAMI, um, we, we have our ending the silence for both school teachers, for school staff, but also for parents. And so ending the silence really gives you kind of a quick and dirty over what signs, symptoms are, what are ways to listen more effectively, how do you really support your young person in the classroom and at home. Um, and then also there are programs such as Mental Health First Aid, which really gives you a comprehensive deep dive into the various uh, mental health diagnoses and disorders and illnesses as they relate to young people and adolescents as well, and how you can best support them depending on what those types of disorders or illnesses are. Are. Um, and then, you know, I'm sure uh, by being a master teacher and an educational consultant, the list that um, Ms. Jaina is going to share is going to be super duper helpful. But um, NAMI works a lot in community with schools and with parents um, and caregivers as well. Um, and then there are really a lot of resources. I would suggest, you know, checking out GCAL, the Georgia. Um, GCAL is a, a there's an app and there's a number around suicide prevention um, resources if you're looking for support therapists and that type of thing. So you can literally download the app um, onto your phone or to your smart device. So that is GCAL, G-C-A-L. Um, and then also Googling things such as Suicide Prevention Lifeline. They have tons of resources there as well. And it's not just about those who are contemplating suicide, but it gives you great tips around how to manage um, and how to identify whether or not you need some support. Thank you so much, Jaina and Casey. Our next question is from Katrina Go. Katrina said that many high school students that she works with are struggling with their mental health, especially during the pandemic. A lot of them are having feelings of stuckness at home and being separated from their friends, support groups, and other communities. She said, I know there's no blanket solution, but she's curious what your thoughts and tips would be around this and how to support these students. So any of our panelists can answer this question. Well, I, have, I did a, a quick webinar the other day with the organization that works uh, specifically with parents. And the best advice I knew to give them was to just kind of chuck the schedule, <laughs> right? I know that people are working from home and that folks have to be on Zoom calls and be presentable and be available when the boss calls. And But at the same time, we have to set boundaries and understand that our young people aren't um, always adept to understanding the difference between you focusing on your work and you not ignoring them. So a lot of times you're going to have to figure out how to break up your schedule to give them some, um, you know, uninterrupted time. Uh, go outside. I know the goal is for us not to be around a lot of people, but it doesn't mean that you can't step outside on your patio, your porch, your front yard, your backyard. Get some fresh air, some sunshine in your life. Play a game. Get sweaty. Get dirty with your kids. It makes a world of difference. I'm unconventional. I don't know. Go outside and scream at the sun for five minutes <laughs> at the top of your lungs, right? Because a lot of times we're holding stress in and we need something that is physical and tangible to release it from our bodies. And so get silly, turn on music, dance until you're tired, um, you know, write, journal, do things that you thought you couldn't ever do. I mean, you're around your family. If you can't be silly with them, then who can you be silly with? And so I think a lot of it is that parents are trying to stick to a schedule. Right, especially when school was still um, going full force in terms of right when uh, the shelter in place order was given and you gotta jump on Zoom at a certain time to catch the teacher and assignments have to be turned in. And I had a parent give me a, kind of a word of wisdom it goes right back to Erica's point of self-care. She emailed the teacher and said, hey, we are having a bad day in this house all around. My child will not be logging on to Zoom and they will not be sending in assignments today. We will send them tomorrow because I need to make sure my child's mental health is okay today. Stop feeling like you have to keep up with everything. You don't. And set boundaries in place and then make other people adhere to your boundaries for yourself and for your family so that when we come out on the other side, we come out stronger. But I think a lot of it is understanding that life is not normal right now. There's no need to try to make it normal right now. Um, rest and lean in the, you know, the, the difference 
of schedule and time that we have right now, create new memories, create new traditions. But at the same time, this is the best way to teach your children what's important it is your self-care, your mental health, your emotional health versus trying to keep up with the schedule and somebody else's expectations of you because that is what works best for them. So check the schedule some days. I promise you, your child is still going to get into college and they're still going to be okay if you don't turn the assignment in today. They'll be all I right. I love that. Thank you, Casey. I think we have time for one more question. That's from Trustine Saxby. Trustine asks, how does a parent balance pushing their children to greatness in the society without causing toxic stress or anxiety? That's a great question. Would anyone like to answer that one? Sure. Sure. I can, I can speak to that some. Um, I think we have to find balance between what the child wants and what we want as well and make sure that we're not trying to push children into doing something that we may not have accomplished, you know, um, coming up. So I think finding a balance between um, these are the things that I have for you or these, this is what I pictured you wanting to do. What about what you want to do as well? So having that, that constant conversation and not just putting on them what our expectations are, but letting them openly talk about how they're feeling and what they're experiencing and what their actual goals are because it's natural for a parent to push a child towards going to college because that that's the right thing to do but have you really is you know does your child really like school do they like learning do they you know so really finding that balance because we we've, we've all learned now that having a, a college degree doesn't necessarily define success so what is success to you what does that look like all right. I, I believe it looks like what do you believe it looks like so having those conversations as opposed to us having this blanket list of you have to graduate from high school with a 3.9 you have to go to college you're applying to 17 different colleges these are the 15 different activities you need to participate in so we should not have a laundry list of accomplishments that our children need to accomplish we because you're taking them out and just really focusing on what you think they need. Focus on the child and what they need and what they say. Listen to what they're saying. An excellent point, Erica. I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Jaina Johnson Davis, Erica Williams Walker, Casey Venning. Thank you so much for your selflessness and your time that you've dedicated to us today to talk about young people's mental health. It was so valuable for our communities to hear what you're what you said and we thank you so much on behalf of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. We also want to invite our audience to attend our remaining webinars that we have on June 1st, June 15th, and then our final one will be June 29th. And we want to thank you all for attending. We're at the end of our hour and we hope you are all well, be safe, and thank you so much. Please join us again in two weeks. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>